Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And today's topic is one that I have been scribbling in various notebooks for years. I kind of keep a notebook that's my to-do list and scheduler, and then I will move to the next one and I will scribble it in the next one and go, oh, revisit that one too. <laughs> to keep a section at the back for those scribbles. And you have actually heard an abbreviated version of her story on the show before. She appeared in the 2012 episode by Sarah and Dublina titled Four Flights of Female Aviators. But to me, calling her an aviator kind of ignores what you could argue is really the biggest part of her life, which is journalism. That previous episode touches on her journalism a bit, but it really did seem that Quimby actually carved out a very nice life for herself by merging her love of adventure with really quite a knack for writing. And she always said that her career was the most important, and she did things to sort of protect her career, which we'll talk about in the episode. And it can be a little bit tricky to get a sense of this person's life, which is Harriet Quimby, uh, particularly her early life, because she herself sometimes changed the details in telling her life story in an effort to sort of craft this public persona that was different than her private persona. And we'll talk about kind of where that originates. Seems almost like a theme lately. Right? I mean, we we run into that a lot, and it was mm. certainly way easier in the late 1800s and early 1900s to go, you know, I'm just going to tweak this a little. <laughs> <laughs> no one will know. But even though she did remain very private about a lot of her her personal details in her personal life throughout her entire life, her public life was very well documented. And she was something of a celebrity journalist in her day, even before she became famous for her feats of flying. Uh, but of course, what truly made her famous on the world stage was aviation. Quimby was born in Coldwater, Michigan on May 11th, 1875. Coldwater is in Branch County, which is roughly the midpoint between Chicago and Detroit. Her parents were William Quimby and Ursula Cook Quimby. William was from an Irish immigrant family, and Ursula was from a comfortable and pretty progressive New York family. William had served in the Union Army in the U.S. Civil War and met Ursula after he was discharged due to illness. After they met in New York, they moved to Michigan to get married and start a family. Harriet was their 10th child, but one of only two, the other being a sister named Helen, who survived until adulthood. And there's no birth certificate that's ever been found for Harriet. And her birthplace has often been misreported because she frequently told people that she had been born in California, San Francisco specifically. And she did spend some of her childhood in Arroyo Grande, California. That's about 250 miles or a little more than 400 kilometers south of San Francisco. And the Quimby's moved to California when Harriet was little, but then they, they moved again within California in 1884. So she was settled in San Francisco by the time she was about nine. But even before they got to California, they had moved from Coldwater, Michigan, to the township of Arcadia in Manistee County. You will sometimes see that listed also as her place of birth. All of these places get listed as her place of birth, depending on what source you're looking at. Uh, and they had made that move from place to place in Michigan after their first farm failed. And that second effort at farming in Michigan didn't succeed either, nor did William's other job, which was running a general store. And all that is why they moved west in search of better opportunities. They ended up farming once again in Arroyo Grande and struggling financially just as they had back in Michigan. William eventually took work in a dairy to support the family, and then they moved once more, this time to San Francisco, Things were a little bit better with the family there. William worked as a salesman, and Ursula sewed packing bags for fruit companies. Yeah, Ursula also was from uh, a family that involved some chemists when she uh, was back east, and so she also started concocting various potions and whatnot, and William would sell them. <laughs> um, one of the things that Harriet was really good at throughout her life was sort of being the person that people wanted her to be. So when she met with the public, she was often characterized not having come from a poor farming family, but having been from a wealthy family. And she seemed pretty inclined to go along with that rather than divulging that she had actually grown up poor on a rural farm. 
And as a sort of middle ground between the truth and the falsehood, she would mention instead that her parents were from the eastern part of the country. In a May 1912 article that appeared in the Baltimore, Maryland paper, The Evening Sun, this bolstering of her parents' backgrounds as part of her story becomes really clear. It reads, quote, Although she is a Californian by birth and has many Western ideas, she first saw the light of day in San Francisco. Her mother is a New Yorker and her father hails from New England. Her father, by the way, is more or less conservative and is not at all favorably impressed by his daughter's flightly tendencies. Her mother, however, is extremely sympathetic, and it has been suggested that she, too, may take flight one of these days, at least as a passenger in her daughter's airplane. Yeah, so they were always kind of refining this image of (laughs) The family. Uh, And this shifting of the facts of Harriet's early years is also often attributed to her mother, really. Ursula Quimby is believed to have been really quite disillusioned after the failed farms and the store, and she wanted her daughters to not depend on a husband for a living. All mention of Harriet's sister actually vanishes from the family story shortly after they moved to California. She eloped and moved away. But Harriet remained, and it seems that Ursula focused all of her energies on ensuring that her remaining daughter was prepared to make her own way in the world. Harriet graduated from high school in Los Gatos, California in 1897. It's unclear exactly when, but at some point in her life as a young woman, her mother Ursula started telling people not only that Harriet had been born in Boston, but also that she had gone to school in France and Switzerland. Ursula also fudged her daughter's age a lot, saying that she was nine years younger than she really was. Whether this was intended to make people think that Quimby was some sort of wunderkind or uh, for some other reason, that's not really clear. Well, and especially when someone is like still quite young, like in their 20s even, to say that they're nine years younger is a a, lot. That's a a big gap. (laughs) So, like, when when Harriet was, you know, 24, she was still telling people she was only 15. Uh, Ursula really wanted, above all else, for her daughter to be a modern career woman. Again, going back to that fear that requiring a man to support you would be a letdown. Uh, and she specifically wanted her to be a journalist because Mrs. Quimby thought that that was a career that would open doors. But at the time, Harriet actually wanted to act. She wanted to be an actor, and she did. Without any apparent training, she started acting in plays in the San Francisco area. And she also worked as a retail clerk. And through those two jobs, she eventually was supporting herself and largely her parents, although they were also still bringing in a small amount of money through their own endeavors. Harriet's stage name was Hazel Quimby, and she really hustled to make this acting dream work. Along with friends, she convinced San Francisco's mayor to lend them the money to rent a theater for the production of Romeo and Juliet. Hazel slash Harriet played Romeo, and she'd gotten an entertainment journalist she knew and was friends with to review the production. That led to Harriet getting more roles in other shows. Throughout this time, she became deeply entrenched in the city's art scene. Yeah, pretty early on, she saw, like, journalism has a power. (laughs) It can make or break people. That becomes more and more important to her. But it was through those connections on the art scene and as a member of San Francisco's Bohemian Club that Harriet actually started working herself as a journalist in 1901 when it started to become apparent that acting was not going to bring in enough money. She wrote an article called The Artist's Colony at Monterey for The Call, and it was a Sunday feature. And in that article, she wrote about the coastal town and its beauty. Later, she made stabs into writing short fiction, including uh, an article called A Night at a Haunted House, which was published on February 2nd, 1902 in the San Francisco Chronicle. But news was really where Harriet Quimby flourished as a writer. And while she primarily covered the arts in San Francisco for both The Call and The Chronicle, she also wrote on a variety of topics, including everything from sex trafficking to hospital reform. She wrote a great deal about San Francisco's Chinese community. She wrote about issues like voting rights for women, which she strongly supported. Although she did identify as a feminist, she felt that label and some of the movements associated with it actually caused more discord than solutions. 
As she was really starting to develop a pretty solid career, there were rumors about her having various romantic partners, but there's no clear evidence of her ever having been seriously involved with anyone. She seemed to be focused almost entirely on her work, which was both gaining her notice and respect. And she decided, after having gotten a taste of all that, that the next logical step for her career was to move to New York and work as a journalist there. So in early 1903, she did just that, despite the fact that she knew no one in New York, and she didn't even know at the time where any of the major newspapers' offices were. We'll talk about her arrival in New York after we take a quick sponsor break. After Harriet got to New York, she spent one night at the Pennsylvania Hotel. And then the next morning, she arranged to rent a room in a boarding house at 68th and 3rd. That was a connection she had made through a reference that one of her San Francisco editors had given her. And after her lodging was sorted, she took her portfolio of published pieces from her work on the West Coast and some new writing that she had done on the five-day trip across the country, and she started visiting publication offices looking for work. Her first stop was at Leslie's Illustrated Weekly, which is a publication that comes up as in the show as having articles about topics that we're talking about. She spoke with two assistant editors who seemed to like her, but she had to return the next day to meet the editor-in-chief before any decisions could be made. After going through one of her samples and verbally telling her all of the edits that he would make, which was just not a level of criticism that she was accustomed to, The editor, John Y. Foster, offered her a job on a trial basis. He also asked if she shouldn't try a more conventional job for a woman, and she told him she was a better writer than she was a cook. Three weeks later, Foster published Harriet's article, Curious Chinese Customs, in which she described the tradition of Chinese paper offerings. That article was picked up by several other outlets. Yeah, right away, her work was super popular. She and Foster actually ended up being great friends uh, for years and years. But but it was kind of a, the way it's described sounds like a tug of war in the beginning of, here's everything wrong with this article. Uh, You you seem plucky, though, so (laughs) we'll try it. And when he asked her if she shouldn't try doing something that was a more natural fit for a woman, her perception was that it was a test and that if she was like, well, maybe, he would have been like, get out. Uh, But instead, she's like, no, this is really all I do. (laughs) After the success of that first article, she took assignments for Leslie's and she wrote a series on the lives of the occupants of tenements in New York. She also campaigned to be given a regular theater review column. She still loved the arts and she was granted that. And soon after that, she was just given the title of drama critic because she did so well. And this was a role that she filled with enthusiasm. Often, her coverage included interviews with actors in various shows, a number of which she had met or been friends with back in San Francisco. And if she didn't know someone, she was still usually able to win them over and get them to consent to a conversation about their work on the record. One of her great successes as the paper's drama critic was a section at the end of her weekly column that offered a list of which plays a man might safely take his wife or daughter to. I have thoughts. Uh, <laughs> I do, too. It's sort of charming and insulting all at the same time. Uh, yeah, it's a tangle. <laughs> Quimby was doing well at this time. She may not have been working exclusively for Leslie's. It's possible she was also writing for other publications under other pen names, although there's no solid evidence there. But she was making enough that she was able to move out of the boarding house into a place of her own at Hotel Victoria at 27th and Broadway, That was convenient. It put her closer to work. In addition to moving into a nicer place, Harriet also started traveling for work. She went on assignment to Cuba to write a series of stories for Leslie's, and subsequently she became the paper's travel correspondent. After that, she traveled the world in search of stories. And while she had been living in San Francisco, she had become friends with German-American photographer Arnold Genta, and he had taught her how to take photographs. This skill really served her well in her new role because she was able to photograph her travels throughout Europe, Africa, and South America herself, making her a photojournalist as well. The first years of the 1900s had really offered Harriet Quimby exactly the life she wanted, one that was filled with success and adventure. 
This is also the time when automobiles were being developed, both for racing and for a wider consumer market. Quimby had ridden in a race car on Long Island while covering the topic for a paper. And after that, she really wanted to learn to drive. She took lessons, got her license, and bought herself a Model T in 1908. Over the next several years, she tracked the growing popularity of automobiles in the United States with a particular eye toward women drivers, noting that driving eventually became a fashionable activity for a modern woman. She also used her platform as a writer to encourage women to learn how their cars worked for themselves so they would not be taken advantage of by mechanics. As an aside, you might sometimes see Harriet Quimby touted as the first woman to receive a driver's license in the United States. That isn't entirely accurate. Uh, Anne Rainsford French was given a license to drive a, quote, four-wheeled vehicle powered by steam or gas in 1900. So that was about eight years before Harriet's fascination with cars blossomed into her getting a license. Uh, Life magazine actually ran a profile of French who had married and taken the last name Bush in 1952, and by that point, she was 73. As Quimby's journalism star had continued to rise in New York, her circle of friends back in San Francisco did not have the same good fortune. Even those who had been doing well on the San Francisco theater scene found themselves without a safety net after the earthquake and fire of 1906, which we've talked about on the podcast before David Wark Griffith was among those friends. He and his wife, Linda, had been close with Quimby on the West Coast. After struggling to find stage work, Griffith found himself under contract first as an actor at Biograph Studios and then as a director, after which he was able to bring his wife on as an actor as well. Yeah, he was initially a little squirrely about that. He's like, I don't, I don't want to do film. That's not real art. <laughs> <laughs> um, Harriet helped bolster this new avenue for the Griffiths, though, by writing articles about their work and explaining to the public how this still new industry of film turned out its pictures, how the whole thing worked. She would take photos during set visits and publish those photos along with her write-ups, giving her readers a behind-the-scenes peek and kind of helping to elevate public opinion of moving pictures, which had been seen up to that point as kind of seedy, particularly by theater-goers. Harriet also wrote several scripts for Biograph while D.W. was directing there, and she also made a cameo appearance in one of the shorts that she wrote titled Fisher Folks. While working as a screenwriter might have been fun, Harriet was really dedicated to her journalism career. She had no intention of leaving it, but it was a desire to seek out the new and exciting so that she could write about it that led her to the thing that she became most well-known for historically— That was aviation. So in October of 1910, Harriet attended a flying race with her friend Matilda Moisan. This was just a year after Wilbur Wright got paid a massive $15,000 to perform several flying demonstrations in New York as part of the Hudson Fulton celebration. Again, 1910, that's a lot of money. Flying at this point was, of course, new and enthralling, so naturally Harriet gravitated to it. And in the years since Wilbur Wright's demos, aviation racing had emerged as a dangerous but potentially lucrative endeavor. John Moissant, Matilda's brother, was one of the competitors on the day that Harriet attended the event to gather information for an article for Leslie's. John Moissant had studied flying with French aviation expert Louis Blériot and then used his money to set up his own aviation enterprise in the United States. He had been the first pilot to offer regular passenger flights from Paris to London, and once he had established his business, Moissant International Aviators in Mississippi, he continued to offer passenger fares. He and his brother Alfred had also opened a flying school in Mineola, New York, hoping that spectators who saw the races in New York would be enticed to learn to fly themselves. That is exactly what happened to Harriet Quimby. Now, had she attempted to enroll in the school that the Wright brothers had opened, she would have been turned away. The Wrights thought that women only wanted to learn to fly as a sort of stunt and would not take it seriously, and so they did not take on women students, not even their sister. Uh, They also doubted that any women would even make enough money to afford their school. But Quimby, along with Mathilde Moissant, made her case to John and Alfred, as well as to their friend, Elio Stevens, who was a balloonist who also taught at the aviation school. 
Matilda also wanted to fly, and the men agreed, after a bit of cajoling, that if the women could wait until spring, they would teach them. So Harriet busied herself with work, basically counting down the weeks until warm weather. Yeah, that was, like, in October, so she was just like, okay, five months, six months, (laughs) something like that. (laughs) Uh, But unfortunately, John Moisant never became her teacher. He was killed a little over two months after they had met in New York. While he was flying in the Michelin Cup race outside of New Orleans, Louisiana, Moisant's plane had caught a gust of air, and he was thrown from the plane and fell to his death. And while that tragedy caused everyone involved in the Moissant Aviation School to reconsider their future and their agreement to teach Harriet and Matilda how to fly, the school and that plan moved forward. There was a minor bit of deception in the mix. Harriet and Matilda had to disguise themselves as men anytime they were at the airfield. That disguise plan was in part because it was inherently controversial for women to be enrolled. Uh, If you've heard us talk about women's flying clubs and, like, flying as a really popular hobby for women in the U.S., that was later than this. (laughs) This, They're sort of the forerunners in a lot of ways. But Harriet was also protecting her professional reputation. She was always careful anytime she was in public to behave in a way that would in no way invite any criticism for her employer. She loved her job and did not ever want to jeopardize it. And to her, behaving that way was simply part of being a professional journalist. It is also one of the reasons that, we, like we mentioned at the top of the show, that so much of her personal life remains a little bit murky. Right, she was known, for example, to smoke, but only behind closed doors. The only accounts of her doing so are from her close associates, and it was something she would never have been seen doing in public. Similarly, she did not want her attendance at aviation school to put Leslie's in the hot seat before she was ready to write about it. And there was also another layer in play here, because Quimby had not told her editor at Leslie's what she was up to. She wasn't telling anybody she was taking flying lessons. So she had a really vested interest in keeping this whole thing under wraps. Before she was allowed to try her hand at flying, Quimby, like all the other students at the Moissant School, had to learn about aerodynamics and airplane design, as well as basic lessons in engine mechanics. Then there was cockpit time in a simulator that was a plane that was outfitted with all the necessary machinery but was fixed to the floor of the hangar. Then it was basic flight in a plane designed to fly only a few feet off the ground, As she went through all these different lessons, Harriet Quimby was taking notes for the articles she would later write describing this whole process. After five weeks of lessons and tests, which included a final week of piloting with an altitude limiter, the students at the Moisant School moved on to actually flying a monoplane built in the French style of Blériot. This aircraft was made of wood, piano wire, and rubber-coated silk, And though she got coated in castor oil spray from the engine, Harriet loved the experience of flying. Despite her efforts to stay anonymous through this male-presenting disguise, Harriet was found out by a reporter from the New York Times. This reporter cornered her at the school one morning and foolishly asked her if she liked flying. She replied, well, I'm out here at 4 a.m. each day. That ought to be answer enough. Well, she was quippy in that moment. This outing forced her to confess to her bosses at Leslie's that she had been secretly attending flight school with the intention of writing about it, and then she had gotten scooped in the process. (laughs) Right? Like, I'm going to write this amazing thing. Someone else is coming out with the article first. Sorry, this might also discredit the paper. Uh, But those discussions where she confessed what was going on to her bosses actually went really quite well, probably because they were a little accustomed to having this writer who kind of did as she pleased and then wrote about it. There was no big surprise in the Leslie's offices, and this venture was kind of seen as a, a pretty big potential paper seller. Consider that this was a woman in flight school, which was controversial enough that other papers wanted to write about their reporter doing it. And while the Times was planning to go to press with the story before Leslie's could, it would not have been able to include any of Harriet's firsthand accounts of the experience. The Times ran their story in early May. And on May 25th, Leslie's ran the article, 
How a Woman Learns to Fly. It was the first in a series, and that series was very popular. Leslie's Weekly was so happy with the series that Quimby was actually reimbursed for her expensive flying lessons. In a moment, we'll talk about how Quimby gained new levels of fame from the pilot seat, but first, we'll hear from some of the sponsors that keep Stuff You Missed in History class going. Throughout the publication of those early articles in the series, Quimby was still in flight school. She had not yet taken her pilot's exam. That didn't happen until August of 1911. And initially, the officials from the Aero Club of America who facilitated such exams did not even want to bother testing Quimby. They thought this whole thing was a stunt and that it was going to be a waste of their time. The flight school had to schedule her test in the same session as a male pilot candidate just to get those officials to agree to travel to the airfield. In the first day of her test, she did pretty well on the first two segments, which involved various flight maneuvers like figure eights. But then she misjudged the third test, which was landing, and she put the plane down too far from the target. She had the chance to retest the next day, so she resolved to do it. Mathilde Moisson agreed to also test, but wanted to let Harriet go first so that she could be the first woman to be issued a pilot's license. The day initially looked like it was a bust because of heavy fog conditions, but things cleared up by midday. Despite some gusty wind, Harriet managed to complete the first two parts of the test again, and then in the third section, she executed a precise landing. When she emerged from her plane, she got in a dig to the ongoing inability of women to vote in the U.S. by quipping, believe me, flying is much easier than voting. That might be my favorite thing she ever said. Uh, Harriet was already a celebrity in New York by this point. All the way back to her theater articles, she had been really popular. But becoming a licensed pilot expanded her fame considerably, and she gained a devoted following. When she made public appearances, huge crowds gathered to see her, both because of the novelty and because she was very charming. Her first paid gig as a pilot was in Staten Island in October of 1911, So just a couple of months after she got her license, and more than 20,000 people filled the field, and they actually had to clear the field for safety. And even as she tried to land after her flight, there were spectators running onto the field that caused her to have to make a bouncy and slightly dangerous landing just beyond the target area, although she did so successfully. She got paid $1,500 for that day, and it was the first of many bookings that she would get in the months that followed, sometimes on her own and sometimes with Mathilde Moisant, who had also successfully tested for her license. Soon, Harriet Quimby and the other pilots who flew exhibitions for the Moissant organization were on their way to Mexico City for a festival booking. She was devoted still to her journalism career, and Quimby met her deadlines and sent her articles from on board the ship that was carrying her south. She was to be in Mexico for two months, and she promised to write travel accounts for her editors at Leslie's. But the revolution in Mexico quickly put an end to this booking. The whole team had to flee the country. Soon, Matilda had given up flying after being burned in an accident when her gas tank exploded. And that left Harriet as the only woman pilot on the Moissant team. Harriet had rocketed to fame, but she still had the feeling that there were people that saw her not as a skilled pilot, but as a publicity stunt. She did not like that, and she wanted to prove them wrong. So she plotted a way to prove her mettle. And for her, that was going to be flying across the English Channel. Now, this was something that had been done before, but not by a woman, and really not very often even by male pilots. A. Leo Stevens from the Moisant team joined her on her journey across the Atlantic. And by this point, he was managing her bookings, and there were rumors that the two of them were a couple, although that remains unverified. They sailed to London on the SS America, and once in London, Harriet secured a sponsorship of $5,000 from the London Daily Mirror. In return, the paper got exclusive European rights to the story of her attempt. This was something of a race to be the first. The plane that Harriet wanted to use was a Blériot that she would be acquiring in France, and it wasn't ready yet when she got there. Louis Blériot had become the first pilot to fly across the channel in 1909, and Quimby wanted to be the first woman to do so. 
So she convinced Blario to loan her a plane for the stunt and completed her purchase for the more powerful plane which she intended to fly back to the United States. But while all of that was being worked out, pilot Gustav Hamel flew a woman passenger, Eleanor Treehawk Davies, across the English Channel. She was not the pilot, but Mrs. Davies became the first woman to cross the channel in a plane. That was a huge blow to Quimby. Yeah, she was super mad about the whole thing. Then when it came time for Harriet to prep for her own flight, there was Gustav Hamel again. He insisted that Harriet let him teach her how to use a compass. That was something she had not done before. And he was kind of like, look, if you get off track going over the channel, things could get really bad. Please let me teach you. Uh, But then he also offered to make the flight for her disguised as a woman. So it seems like that compass thing might not have been so much a kindness as a, you poor ding dong, let me help you. (laughs) It's a little condescending. She did take his compass, but she turned him down on the other offer. Then when the perfect day of flying weather came, Harriet, to everyone's surprise, opted to stay grounded. She said she wouldn't fly that day because it was a Sunday, and she had promised her mother that she would never, ever fly on Sundays. So there's some disappointment, but everybody cleared. And then the weather was clear again on Tuesday, April 16th, 1912, and Harriet took off at 5.30 in the morning, remarking later how once the trip was underway, quote, it seemed so easy. But soon, the fog rolled in. She lost all visibility. She kept an eye on her watch, and after 22 minutes in the air, she decided to start her descent. The Blario's engine flooded when she tipped the nose down, and she considered landing on the water when the gasoline finished burning off and the engine stopped backfiring. As she descended out of the fog, she saw the French coast and put the plane down at Harlow, which was not her intended destination of Calais. She was about 53 kilometers away from her intended landing spot, but she had crossed the English Channel. She did not really speak French uh, terribly well, so the locals kind of communicated to her in in their uh, halting, effort-laden way that you do with someone who doesn't speak your language that she had to move her plane to avoid it being swept to sea when the tide came in. Uh, there was also a local woman who served her breakfast, including tea in a cup that Harriet described as six times larger than any she had ever seen. Uh, The woman insisted she keep the cup as a memento, which Harriet did, and later said that she prized it more than any trophy she could have imagined. And Harriet, at this point, was absolutely elated to have achieved her goal. But what she did not know, and which no one else on the beach with her knew, including the reporters who arrived, was that the Titanic had gone down the night of April 14th. Harriet expected to be the headline in papers around the globe, but the story of that tragedy overtook her accomplishment in press rooms everywhere, unsurprisingly, really. Even in the mirror, which had paid so dearly for this exclusive, the mirror put her story back in the section of the paper that was reserved for advertisements aimed at women. Which, again, like, you could see where it would be downgraded. Maybe a little bit insulting on the placement, but... We should say there was press coverage of Quimby's accomplishment. If you go looking in papers in April of 1912, you'll see that people wrote it up. It just was not nearly the level of coverage uh, that she or her editors at Leslie's had anticipated. And those articles that came out did talk about her achievement, but they were also just as focused on Harriet the person because she was seen as being so unusual, even outside of being the first woman to cross the English Channel. One element of her work that was often mentioned in the news coverage of her flying was actually her clothing. Uh, It was a unique outfit which she had designed herself, and she had collaborated with a prominent New York tailor to have this jumpsuit created that she felt was feminine yet functional for flight. And it was made of satin with a wool backing, and it included a hood, and there were gloves and custom boots. And according to a write-up in the New York Times, this outfit, which was purple, quote, is made in one piece, including the hood, which by an ingenious device can be converted into a conventional walking skirt. Because of her high profile and maybe also because of that purple flying outfit, Quimby was asked to be the new spokesperson for the Armor Company, promoting their grape soda called Vin Fizz. This made her the first woman to become a brand spokesperson. 
There's a somewhat grisly aspect to all this, though. The prior spokesperson had been Carl Rogers, who made the first transcontinental flight across the U.S. in 1911. Rogers died during an exhibition flight in California two weeks before Harriet Quimby made her English Channel crossing. His death is why this position was even open. Yeah. Uh, A little unsettling. In July of 1912, Harriet was contracted to fly at the Boston Air Meet in Squantum, Massachusetts. She was the big draw of the event and was rumored to have entered into a very profitable contract for it. She was going to fly the plane that she had purchased in France, and that was a two-seater. And in her practice runs, she had experienced an unexplained stall and had plummeted toward the ground before she could level the plane out to land. She and her mechanic had examined everything, and they chalked it up to basically a bad wind gust. The event's promoter, William Willard, was very taken with Quimby and may have had a bit of a crush on her. His interviews about the event all sound sort of wowed about how pretty she was. And when the day came and a coin was tossed to see who her lucky passenger would be, Willard won it. He excitedly joined Harriet in her Blario as she prepared for the twilight flight. So she and her team started the engine, and they ran the plane through its checklist. That was something she did before every single flight. And the first half of that flight went absolutely perfectly. But as the spectators could see against the orange sunset sky, just after it had made its turn at the halfway point to come back, the plane's tail whipped upward into the air. It was basically pointed down. Willard had been ejected from his seat. Harriet, seemingly unaware of her lost passenger initially, struggled to try to right the plane. She did make some initial progress, but then she lost control entirely. She was also thrown from the craft, and she and Willard, as well as the Blario, plummeted into Dorchester Bay. It was low tide. The plane, surprisingly, managed to bob upright in the water and glide to a stop. But the bodies of the pilot and passenger were retrieved and taken to Quincy Hospital, although they were both already dead on the scene. A particularly heartless write up of this tragedy appeared in the Spokesman Review of Spokane, Washington, under the headline Little Miss Dresden China Broken at Last. The subhead read quote, How Harriet Quimby, most daring of air women, apparently nothing but frivolous femininity full of odd superstitions, was flipped out of her flying machine by the hand from the clouds which she had always feared. That nickname in the headline, the Dresden China Aviatress, had come from the fact that she was always really quite dainty and ladylike in her public persona. She also hated that nickname. And her superstitious nature was well known. She had always carried good luck charms, and she wore what she believed to be lucky jewelry. But of course, it seems incredibly cruel to sum up her death in this sensationalist manner, which reads like the 1912 equivalent of clickbait. And it also robs her of her reputation within the aviation community for being fearless, yes, but also being very skilled and really very careful. The article includes a lot of speculation about how she must have panicked and done something wrong to cause the crash. The actual cause was never conclusively determined, but there were several possibilities that were evident right away. Examination of the just freakishly undamaged Blario showed that the left rudder wire was caught on the lever that operated the wings. But there was some debate over whether that had been the cause or whether it was something that had happened on the way down or possibly on impact. One theory was that Quimby had briefly lost consciousness, and by the time she came to, the plane was too out of control to regain it. Another theory was that William Willard, who was a large man and had been leaning far forward to speak to her in flight, might have unwittingly caused the Blario to become unbalanced. An article appeared in Aircraft Magazine suggesting that the design of the Blario was fundamentally unstable and that the tail wing was the cause. Obviously, safety belts were not in use. They were not standard safety equipment yet. There were witnesses who claimed that they did see Quimby, quote, buckle a broad strap across the space in front of her. If she did that, she had unbuckled it at some point afterward. For several months after Harriet Quimby's death, 
articles that she had filed before that final flight continued to be published. And one in particular reads as sort of bittersweet. Uh, It was about the potential for careers in flight for women. She wrote, quote, There is no sport that affords the same amount of excitement and joy or exacts in return so little muscular strength as flying. It is easier than walking or driving, simpler than golf or tennis. There is no reason why the airplane should not open a fruitful occupation for women. She was so young when she died. Yeah. I've listened to that uh, Flights of Four. Uh, I think it's Four Female... You said it at the beginning of the episode, and now I've forgotten what the exact title of that older episode was. I listened to it one time way in the past uh, when I was trying to figure out like which which people were discussed in it. And I have forgotten a lot of the details in the intervening years. Um, and so I did not realize when I started out reading through this uh, episode for the first time that that she did die at such a very young age and so early in her career as a pilot when that became the thing that she was really known for. Yeah, I mean, she was a pilot for, a licensed pilot for less than a year of her life, whereas she had been a journalist for quite some time at that point um, and had really, I, I, it, like I said at the top of the episode, I'm always a little like, mm, when people are like, aviator Harriet mm-hmm. Quimby and it's like she was but like I don't think she would have necessarily identified that way I think she would say she was a journalist first and there are quotes from her where people asked her are you giving up your journalism career to fly full-time and she was like no way um, she was always still planning to keep writing she actually had been talking about um leaving journalism and possibly leaving piloting for a while after that flight where she died so that she could write a novel because it was something she had always wanted to try and had never done. Mm -hmm. Um, And of course that did not happen, uh, which is terribly sad, but also she's quite a creature. She's a, can be a little bit conflicting in that in some ways she is the perfect role of like feminism and, you know, a woman really being in charge of her life and not, defining herself by the men in her life, but then she would do things like, here are plays you can safely take your wife to. (laughs) Right. (laughs) It's like, oh, Harriet, no! But also very savvy, because people loved that part of the thing, uh, that part of her her articles. Uh, Since this is a little bit of a downer place, I thought we would do a fun listener mail. I think that's a good idea. About a topic I keep talking about, which is that darn Rougarou, but I love him so much. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this comes from our listener, Amanda, who writes, Holly and Tracy, hello, my name is Amanda. I am a huge history nerd and have been an avid listener from almost the beginning. I'd like to thank you ladies for keeping me company for years now during my hour-long commute to and from work. You guys get me cracking up first thing in the morning, which is no small feat, and it starts my day out on a good note. This is my first time writing because I just had to let Holly know what I found in my home state of Alabama. I found her the perfect road trip worthy restaurant. Get this, it has a Rougarou theme. It's in Birmingham, and of course it serves Cajun cuisine. I haven't been yet, but am planning to very soon. I included pics I found online of the restaurant and of the stuffed Rougarou. I will let you both know if it's any good. Thanks again for all the hard work you do. I know all your listeners, including myself, adore you both. She also included uh, pictures of her dog, Pepper, who is cute. Mm -hmm. Um, So here's a weird thing that came up and why I wanted to read this one. It feels like I am destined to go visit this restaurant and here is why. Someone sent me a photo completely unrelated to any work stuff and it had Rougarou with this spelling, which has an X on the end, like a Roo. Um, and I was like, is, what is that? What is that place in the background? It was like in the background of a picture. And I was like, what? Is, so I started looking for it online and I found this restaurant. And then this email came like two hours later. And I was like, that's weird. <laughs> um, so it feels like I need to get in the car and go to Rougarou at some point in Alabama, maybe en route to Homa, where I can go visit the actual Rougarou and teach him how to count higher than 12. Um, (laughs) It just just seemed like if I didn't read it, something bad might happen. The Rougarou (laughs) is sending me signals. It wants to be your friend, Holly. Great! As long as it's nice to my cats, he can live here. Like I said, I'll make him some flashcards. We'll work on the math. Um, If you do get to go, Amanda, please tell us what the food is like. Sample everything. Tell us all the details. 
I'm thinking about Cajun food now. Uh, if you would like to write to us about your experiences at Rougarou themed restaurants or otherwise, you can do that at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. You can find us all over social media as Missed in History, and you can subscribe to the podcast on the iHeartRadio app or wherever it is you listen. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.